If you have your Bibles with you, turn with me to Matthew chapter 19. Matthew chapter 19. 28 chapters. We're already in almost 20. We'll be finished with 20 here tonight. It seems like it just went really fast in many ways. When you're looking at the ministry of Jesus, it, it obviously the, the books can't be all of the miracles can't be printed or written, otherwise it would fill all the libraries up for all that the Lord has done. But Matthew has selected these chapters and by the leading of the Holy Spirit, and they are wonderful. Short, short little time that Jesus was on this earth, but he accomplished great, great things in preparing salvation for all of the world and a reunion with that. So let me pray for us. Lord, we thank you for uh, Matthew and his life and his salvation and his heart turning as a tax collector uh, to your son Jesus as he, as he walked by and he left everything that he had to follow him. And now um, he's in heaven uh, with your son and uh, Lord, we thank you for what you put on his heart, Lord, and gave him to give to us and uh, what encouragement that is. And Lord, we pray that you administer to us through your Holy Spirit. Break the word of God open to us and, and uh, minister to our hearts, Lord, in our lives and, and uh, that we would walk out of here feeling like we've just been in the light, just having the light of truth shine on to our hearts and our minds and uh, Lord with that the power and strength of your Holy Spirit to prepare us for uh, what you have for us for tomorrow and but we just thank you for this time we give you praise for it and we thank you in Jesus name amen can't stop thinking about that last chapter where he just speaks about you know being in their midst if two, you know two or more are gathered I'm I'm with them and he's talking about his authority but we know now as believers, He is with us. He's here with us. God is here. He's present. He's present in our lives. And um, there's a, a, a blessing that takes place as two or more are gathered, but there's a power and authority. And so Jesus has been trying to prepare these 12 knuckleheads for you know, one of the great jobs, um, you know, ministry, uh, seasons of, of probably anybody in history, and they don't have a clue. I mean, they just don't get it. Every time the Lord says, I'm leaving, it's not registering in their minds. And even up till the last, uh, you know, chapters that we read, and even in John, he, he says, I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I'll come again to receive you unto my, you know, myself. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you, and I'm like, I go to prepare a place for you. And then, you know, Thomas goes, where are you going? We don't know where you're going. It's like, even at that point, he didn't, he didn't know where he, they were going. And, uh, and so um, it's going to dawn on them, but he's preparing them. And so last, in the last chapter, we see that the, the Lord is requiring a different kind of leadership. It's different than any kind of leadership that they've ever seen. And the church works differently than the world works. Um, and one of the biggest things about the church, uh, one of the kind of important things that we see is that God uses servants as his leaders. And uh, because that's who Jesus was. He was a servant leader. And so he's driving home some of these points to them. But, you know, our flesh doesn't like to serve. It's not natural to say, you know, if I was going to tell you, I'd say, hey, I got one of the greatest positions ever for you. It's the highest position that's known here. Uh, what is it? It's servant. You're going to serve people. You're going to serve them in all of their needs. Um, it, not a lot of people would apply for the job, right? I don't want that job. But those are the greatest jobs in God's kingdom. So getting their minds and their hearts prepared uh, to be that is going to be difficult. And uh, he's already called them out on, on how they represent him. And they don't need to wound people, but they have to be willing to kick out the wolves 
out of the church. It's going to have to be a tough position because they're going to have to call these guys out who are doing wicked things and won't repent of it. And, and they've got to have the courage to do that. But yet, in the end, as we finished up this last week, they have to be extremely willing to forgive. And the church should be, again, filled with the love of God, filled with the grace of God, and uh, love that section there of being reminded of how many times we forgive, and our hearts should be willing to forgive 70 times 7. And uh, so that anybody who is a true believer and who's willing to repent of their sins, then the church is willing to forgive them of their sins as the Lord has forgiven them. And uh, what a powerful thing that is. And um, so um, Peter, you know, made his question uh, known to the Lord, you know, seven times and no, oh, 70 times seven. <laughs> it just blew his mind because his mind wasn't ready to forgive that much. And uh, but uh, again, the, the Lord is preparing him to do that. What is he doing? He's building a new temple. Okay. But this one is a living temple. It's a spiritual building, isn't it? And uh, Jesus is the head of it. It's called the church. And um, it's a spiritual house, and he's going to be the leader of it. And uh, if they want to be great leaders in his kingdom, then, then they're going to have to be willing to be uh, servants of everyone else. And so we'll see the process unfold. Their righteousness is going to have to be greater than the leader's of the other temple, which is the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and he's been exposing them. It's phony, it's fake, it's not real. They're not willing to serve anybody. They want to be served. And it's the world's kind of leadership. And so, um, praise the Lord, um, they're going to see a new kind of leader in Jesus who's willing to lay down his life for everyone to give his life away. So, their righteousness is going to have to uh, um, exceed that. Chapter 19, verse 1. When Jesus had finished these words, he departed from Galilee. And he came into the region of Judea beyond uh, the Jordan. Jesus hasn't made, uh, he's only made a couple of trips up to Jerusalem. But uh, in this later season, he hasn't. And, and um, because he knows they're waiting to kill him. And uh, so even the disciples don't really fully understand that, but he's told them several times, and even his own brothers have called him out on it. Why don't you just go up to the temple then and declare who you are? And, and he spoke of that saying, well, you know that they want to kill me. And so it was almost as if his brothers were saying, his own half-brothers were saying, well, if you really are, then you won't die. And so he's traveled from Galilee um, all the way down to the region of Judea, but beyond the Jordan. So basically, when you leave Galilee and you're on the tours, you leave the southern part of the Sea of Galilee and you just start following the Jordan. Um, and so you spend hours on that journey, that direction, and you finally come down almost to the Dead Sea. And you're working your way downhill, you know, that way, following the river, but... Um, Jericho was, of course, a famous um, city there, uh, one of the first um, cities that was conquered, you know, by uh, Israel as they went in. The walls of Jericho came down. And um, so now he's getting close to Jerusalem. And he knows, but they don't know what all is going to unfold. And large crowds followed him and he healed them there. Um, so this is a region that is, you know, below Jerusalem. Jerusalem, I believe, is 2,500 feet above sea level, 2,600. And Jericho is about 800, um, is it meters or below, below sea level. So this is a city that sits below sea level, almost 1,000 um, feet below sea level. So some Pharisees came to Jesus testing him and they asked him, he says, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any reason at all? Um, now when he encounters the Pharisees and the Sadducees, they're just trying to find fault with him, trying to, 
when it says test him, they're not trying to see if he's legitimate. They've already ruled him out. They're just trying to, to uh, get him to fail. So it's not a test to, to see how well you do and hope you pass. It's a, they're trying to trick him. Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any reason at all? Boy, that's a, that's a whole, you know, pile of mess right there. You think about the history of Israel and you think about the history of man and marriage and, wow, that's a deep thing. I, I could probably spend 40 hours on this and you'd probably go away going, I don't know if I agree with all of that on everything on marriage and divorce and all of that. But he answered them, he says, have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female? And he said, for this reason, a man shall leave his father and his mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let no man separate. Now we're going to talk about divorce a little bit here and what the Bible has to say about it, but I just want you to kind of take note of something. There's always something behind you know, uh, Jesus is teaching here. And one of the, the things that we look at in the Old Testament about, you know, divorce, it's a breaking of a union, isn't it? A sacred union. Jesus goes all the way back to the beginning, to the book of Genesis. He goes back to God's design, what it was for. And he lays out this... Um, institution that God made called marriage. It's part of the design of man and woman. Of course, it's laid out there in the garden when, you know, Adam was looking around and he had no one uh, helpmate uh, for him. He's naming all the animals and they're male and female. And, and then he kind of realizes, hey, there's no female. And uh, then the Lord, of course, he makes the woman from the rib of the man and uh, and beautiful, you know, passage of scripture, and um, but the point was is that that was God's design. In order to have families, have children, to be fruitful and multiply and, and fill the earth, there would need to be these uh, groupings of what we call marriage, and the design was it would be one man and one woman, and uh, they would uh, come together. And they would become one. So in the back of this, and what's clearly on Jesus' mind as well, is that God has also made us for a relationship with him. That's how we're designed. And we're not complete without that. In fact, we're empty and, and we're dead without that relationship. So... Behind that, we, we look at the history of Israel and Jesus is, is looking for Israel to accept him as their king and that there would be a marriage that would take place, a reunification because back in history, when we read the Old Testament and we just learned that in Isaiah, is that he said if you keep following, keep having affairs, basically you keep committing adultery, fornication against me with these other gods, um, I've, eventually I'm going to sever the relationship. And he did. Because they wouldn't relent. And so he cut them off. And then they were pushed out of the land. So that was their home there made by the Lord. And they were supposed to be in union and fellowship with the Lord. And now they were pushed out of that. And so in this also is that idea that God wants Israel to love him and to submit to him and in that way of marriage. And um, we know that in the body of Christ, um, it is the same type of thing. Jesus is the head, but he's also the groom, right? He's the leader of the church, but he's also the groom and we're his bride. And so that fulfillment um, that was supposed to come through Israel um, is going to come through the church. And so we're, we have a loving relationship and that same unity. In fact, when Paul uh, kind of lays all of this out in Ephesians, he lays that out and he says, but I don't speak of man, I speak of Christ and the church. 
when he talks about the two shall become one flesh. And of course, that's the ultimate thing that God wants from us, right? He wants to be married uh, in a marriage relationship, in a, in a union together where we become one with him. So it isn't just about solving all the intricacies of divorce in this section, um, but it's really about what's lying uh, underneath. That's the way it was. That's the way God made it. It's his institution. And of course, the world does not want to recognize that, that these things are God's. God designed the world this way. He made us. He fashioned us for this. And they, and they want, of course, they want to push God out. And so they've lost all idea of what marriage is supposed to be because they've lost the founder of it, the creator of it. You're never going to figure out marriage until you figure out God and what a marriage is about. And uh, so marriage is not up for man's interpretation and it's not up for negotiation. It's, it's just beautiful and wonderful when we read it. And I think all of us, as we read that, it's, it's a beautiful story. It's a love story, right? Here's Adam and, you know, then God creates Eve. And now, I, you know, we shall be one. The two shall become one flesh. It's beautiful. It's wonderful. In fact, even in Hollywood today, even with all of their ideas of what makes a family, what makes marriage, what, you know, re, you know, crossing all the boundaries and all of it, still the, the best things they can produce on, in their love stories is when a man, you know, meets a woman and they fall in love and they try to do it without marriage, but it, isn't, it doesn't, doesn't become the great story. It's when the two of them, against all odds, they come together as one and, and they're looking forward to a life together. That's what everybody sees as beautiful. Now, that isn't what happens with everybody, but uh, that's what we see. Why? Because it's natural. It's biological, isn't it? Um, and when he describes it the way, that's part of the creation. It's, it's just the most natural thing uh, that we see. And all civilizations throughout all of the history of man, they've had a, a sense of trying to find that, un, you know, that thing of marriage. And of course, most all civilizations um, have you know, walked in the ways of the creator in that even though they've had their own troubles. But any society that has pushed that aside and began to be uh, move away from God's design of marriage and the family, um, those societies have been destroyed. They lost their fabric there. So Jesus is not in any way saying that this is uh, not important, but in fact, he's going back and he's just telling those guys what they already know. Hey, you know how God made it. This is what it's designed for. You're talking about divorce because you're looking for a way to leave that woman and to get, you know, find a, get another woman. And, um, and so he's saying, no, that's not what was intended uh, by the Lord. And so where marriage goes and the family uh, goes with it, and uh, when the family structure is corrupted, then uh, so does the society. And boy, are we living it right now, aren't we? You lose those core things and you lose the fabric of a society. I don't care what you do, how much money you make, what all things you try to do uh, and pass and, and all the other parts of society. You lose that structure and you, you've lost it. And um, now God can repair things and praise the Lord for that. But we have to go back to acknowledging what, what God's design is uh, regardless of uh, any of the options that we have to leave uh, a marriage or to be, you know, uh, to go through divorce. And God says he hates divorce. He hates it. I think the, in Scripture, in the Old Testament, the thing that he is the most passionate about is when he talks about divorcing Israel, cutting them off. And um, painful um, and, uh, you know, if any of us have been through a divorce or anybody who knows people uh, that have been through divorce, which, you know, uh, I do, and it's just horrible. It's just horrible. It's painful. It's tough. It's not, the Lord can forgive and all of that, but it's still just one of the more brutal things that you see you know, on the planet there, um, and um, all of it points back to 
um, man having a relationship and a loving relationship uh, with the Lord. So let's, let's take a look at that here. Um, Genesis uh, 2, 20, 22 through 25 says, The Lord God fashioned into a woman uh, the rib which he had taken from the man and he brought it and brought her to the man. Now, you notice that Jesus states the same thing. There's a woman, there's a man. And the man said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and his mother and be joined to his wife and they shall become one flesh. Very simple, isn't it? Marriage requires a man and a woman. And um, um, they're designed to come together and to be one. And a part of that is what makes a family. It's when the man leaves his family his mother and father, that marriage uh, union there and the authority that comes with it. And then he, he, he gathers with his wife and the two of them become now one uh, together, uh, one family and that leadership structure. Now question, when, when we read this and when you read it, um, is it confusing? Is there anything in it that you go, I don't think I really get that. I don't understand it. I mean, I'm reading it, but I don't really understand. What does that mean? Right? It's just very simple, isn't it? Very basic. Um, what did God intend with that? Well, in the Old Testament, we have leaders of Israel that defied that and had multiple wives. God allowed it, but it cost them dearly. In fact, with Solomon, it cost him it cost him the kingdom. He split the kingdom because these wives that he had taken had led him into f- idolatry and all of that. There was nothing good uh, that came out of it. And so, um, even in our society, I think everybody can understand that. Verse 7, it says, They said to him, Why then did Moses command to give her a certificate of divorce and send her away? He kind of throws a little wrench in there. Actually, that's true. Uh, The law allowed a man to be able to give his wife a a certificate of divorce. That's in Deuteronomy chapter 24, 1 through 4. Jesus said to them, Because of your hardness of heart, Moses permitted you to divorce your wives. But from the beginning... It has not been this way. Now, there's something interesting about that. When we, when we see Adam and Eve in the garden, uh, what we see with that is purity, don't we? There wasn't a fallen nature yet. Uh, there would have been a lot of beautiful, wonderful, perfect marriages um, if man wouldn't have rebelled against God. And uh, that would have been wonderful to see. And so we see in that picture there that something was broken and, uh, and that's the core of what brings divorce. And it's the brokenness, fallenness, hardness of our hearts that leads to these things. It isn't God who does it. There's nothing inside there where God leads us to, you know, God forbid if any of us said that, well, I believe God is telling me to divorce you. Um, no, it isn't God that's doing that. It's the hardness of your heart and and I know it's a two-way street in that, in that way, but he's speaking to them, especially within this new circle, which is going to be believers, those who follow the Lord. He's going to tighten the noose uh, here in just a minute, and he's going to narrow it right down to the way God would intend it to be, a marriage and then the situation of divorce. And so he says, and I say to you, whoever divorces his wife, except for immorality, And marries another woman commits adultery. Now, this writ of divorce that that is in the law gave the man if if it, it says he could divorce her if he finds indecency in her. Well, the rabbis just had a field day with that, because what is indecency? And uh, so they had a real kind of a hardcore group that said, no, no, that means you know, something either dial, you know, diametrically opposed to God and goodness and some kind of deep wickedness, 
or the other group, which was Hillel, and he had a group that said, basically, if she burns the toast, you know, that's a big, it's a big difference. And uh, so how do you interpret that word, you know? And so, of course, they used that. The bigger uh, following was Hillel, right? And I don't like the way you did that. That's, you know, and so, you know, that's indecency and, 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 and I'm going to give you this writ uh, of divorce. But then with that, the law said she's free to remarry. So the purpose that we see when we read the law was that the Lord was protecting the, wom- the woman, giving her some protection. Yes, he could put me away, you know, give me a writ of divorce, um, but then he would no longer have control you know, over me, and that she would be free to uh, marry uh, or or remarry. But if her new husband, just theoretically, uh, you know, turns against her and he gives her a certificate, this section says then the first husband's not free to take again uh, his wife that he put away. This is an abomination. So, Back then, the ladies were, you know, again, they didn't choose their husbands. They were kind of given their husbands by their families. And so this was a protection to them that this guy would be able to take her back again in this situation. And so it doesn't say that, she, you know, she's, you know, not guilty of anything, but it's basically giving up protection. And, and that's important. And uh, the Lord always you know, offers that because those in authority or those who have the uh, strength in that position uh, could abuse that. But this, this way, the, the guy could not, could not uh, abuse that. And she wouldn't have to suffer that uh, again. And uh, I don't think the Lord intends us, you know, marriage to be this great suffering lesson. <laughs> um, but there are times that the, those things are hard and seasons that they're hard. And hopefully, if there are two believers, then those are things that God can uh, bring forgiveness and restoration and love and all the things that would be expected. So, but the problem is men's hearts, the hardness of their hearts. And so uh, that wasn't the way God wanted it. It wasn't the way that he designed it. Um, you know, it, but, so he goes back and says, this is the way God wants it. And then in the end, he comes back and he says, listen, if you do, um, whoever divorces his wife except for immorality marries another woman uh, and commits adultery. So in the, in the Old Testament, this law had nothing to do with adultery. So if the woman that he was married to commits adultery, she would be stoned by the law. And so would the man who slept with another man's wife, whether he was married or not, he would die. And then the two that remained in those two marriages would be free to uh, go on and, and get married again. And uh, so in that sense, we're not talking about uh, uh, adultery here. So that was a whole other way that God dealt with it. Um, are you thankful that God doesn't still institute that? And, uh, but that's what he said. This is the way it's designed here under the law. But now Jesus is speaking of in the New Testament as well. And so now um, those laws aren't going to apply. They're not going to apply in Israel because they're not going to enforce it. And, um, and then also all over the known world, they're not going to kill the person for committing uh, adultery. But Jesus said, whoever divorces his wife except for immorality. So he narrows it pretty down pretty well, doesn't he? And, um, and so, but God understands adultery, doesn't he? And that's exactly what he dealt with with Israel. And he said, I'm not going to, you know, force you to be in a, in a marriage where th- there's unfaithfulness there. And I'm not going to, uh, you know, I'll give you the, the ability to get out of that. Interesting that Paul goes on and he adds to that. And so later on in the New Testament, um, Paul uh, writes and he speaks to believers and he says, listen, if you are um, a believer, you get saved and you're married to an unbeliever, then you as the believer are bound to that marriage. You stay, you don't leave because she's not a believer. You can't say, well, she's not a believer. I need to find a believer. No. 
Um, because he goes on to say, how do you know that you won't win them to Christ? You minister to them, and that can be really difficult. But, um, on the other hand, if that person that you marry does not want to live with you because you're a believer, then Paul says, listen, you're released from that. You can't force that person for a man to force his wife to stay married to him um, when she's uh, obviously does not want to be married to a believer, and vice versa. Paul gave it both, uh, both directions. So there's really two things that the Bible speaks about openly and clearly to us is that, you know, obviously there's adultery, and then there's, of course, somebody who is a, non- a non-believer. If you're a believer and you say, well, I don't want to live with you, well, that's another issue then are you really a believer and why not can't you as two believers go back to the Lord and, you know, marriage counseling can be really difficult because it's two people with fallen natures, right? Um, They might have given their life to the Lord and they're new creations on the inside, but they're not always walking in the spirit. They can be walking in the flesh. I personally have never walked in the flesh. So for my wife, what a treat that, I'm just kidding. Okay. But that's just part of, uh, you, know, the, the, you know, the difficult part um, of marriage. But what's beautiful is that both of us, if we desired, could go back to the Lord on that. And there could be humility. And there could be a, a same thing that we're talking about, servanthood. And we could serve the other and um, how beautiful that is when that happens and the Lord is great of, of, um, in restoring uh, a marriage. And again, forgiveness is a big part of that, isn't it? And um, if you're not willing to forgive, it's really hard to get uh, past that. So I'm not going to dive into too much um, past that. But, but verse 9, he says, And I say to you, whoever divorces his wife except for immorality and marries another woman commits uh, adultery. So there's a responsibility to those who, who um, uh, you know, go away from that relationship and then marry somebody else. So what is he doing? He's just trying to put as much, give us as much possible reason that we could to make that work. And he says, you know, if you do that and you have not obeyed the Lord and you've left for whatever reason it is and you go and marry another person, then that's adultery before God. And so I like that. Um, too often, even in counseling today, uh, one of the first things, is, you know, is, well, I'm not happy and he, you know, he didn't speak to me very well and whatever it is. And then they'll go straight to, well, you know, I think you have grounds for, wait a minute. How do we get there already? That can't be the first thing that we go to. And because usually in our hearts, we're wanting a way to get out. And, uh, and so um, the Lord contracts us this way. And I, and I think it's good. Is it, are those sins unforgivable? No. The Lord can forgive them. I divorced him for whatever reason I wanted to. And whatever it was, I was professing to be a believer or I was a believer and Can God forgive that? Yes, he can. And so um, uh, it can be a mess and all those things can be messy, but uh, praise the Lord, we can repent of our sin. The Lord's faithful and just to forgive us of our sin. It's not a damnable thing there. Um, But the the thing that we need to know is, is that if I'm gonna make the next marriage work, then I need to serve the Lord and be obedient to the Lord and be tender toward him. And I need to marry somebody who loves the Lord and wants to be tender to the Lord. Why make that mistake again? How many times do we see that? And they go choose the same you know, situation again and you're just like going, did, did you not learn anything? And um, so by the grace of God, he keeps our marriages, amen? And, uh, and usually we just have to you know, repent as... Uh, big, dumb men that we are and, you know, go back and ask for forgiveness and, and, and do whatever we need to do to make things right in those situations. And hopefully you have a wife that's gracious uh, that way to do that. And of course, vice versa. Verse 10, the disciple said to him, if the relationship of the man with his wife is like this, this is better not to marry. And, and 
the Lord's going to say, that's not a bad idea. Now, God's for marriage. Of course, that's the building block of society. But he's going to acknowledge here that not everybody's made for marriage. And there's different conditions that go on. So he's going to list a, a few of them. He says, not all men can accept this statement, but, but only those to whom it has been given. There are some, and Paul's going to mention that too, there are some people that God has designed not to be married. Why? Because he's going to use them for his kingdom and glory. For there are eunuchs who were born uh, that way from their mother's womb. In other words, they weren't able to have children and they weren't able to, uh, to um, have sexual relations and all of that uh, for a family. And there are eunuchs who were made eunuchs by men. In other words, uh, these powerful men said, if you're going to be around the harem, we're going to make sure there's no babies coming out of there. So and that's what the uh, eunuchs, and you're going to be devoted to serving the king, Right. And there are also eunuchs, and that's what he means by that, who made themselves eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. He who is able to accept this, let him accept it. Now, I don't know all the relationships of all the 12 men that are there. Um, but I know it's going to be really hard to be married and to be in the position that they have uniquely. But Peter was married. And uh, we know that probably many of them were married. But when we read later in the um, New Testament, especially when this guy Paul comes along, he's not married. Now, we don't know that he was uh, ever married. It's possible that he was married. And then when he gave his life to Jesus, she said, adios, right? Because here he was, basically a Pharisee. He was you know, being taught by Gamaliel, uh, you know, in the elite things of the Jewish order there, persecuting Christians, putting them to death, and now he's a follower of them. So, wouldn't be unlikely that she would have said, no, no. But, <clears throat> he, <coughs> excuse me, makes this statement, and to him it is true, and he says it, as he gives it, he says, he says, um, not the Lord, but I say. Now, it doesn't mean that it wasn't divine and it wasn't from God because he was pinning it. It's, uh, it's the eternal word. But he was saying, this, this is not what Jesus has said about marriage. This is what I say about marriage. It's better not to marry. That's your best spot you can be in. Why? From his perspective, you're like this guy here. For the sake of the kingdom, you're fully devoted to whatever the Lord's. You're married to the Lord. And, uh, and that's your devotion. And just think of all the things that the Lord uh, can do with your life. But in the same sense, he says, but not all are called to that. And, uh, but the Lord can speak to you in, in all of your situations. Um, but it's interesting, even as Jesus speaks about it, he's saying, listen, it's okay not to be married. There's not a problem with that. Um, God can even have a design for that. And so, um, um, obviously, he'll, if we pray, he'll speak to our hearts and give us the grace and the um, desire to be um, devoted to him uh, wholly. And I think that's great. Um, so, marriage isn't necessarily for everyone. And um, the Lord wants to use us in whatever place we can be used. Verse 13, Then some children were brought to him so that he might lay his hands on them and pray. And the disciples rebuked them. They just keep missing this. How many times has the Lord said that what the kingdom is like? It's like little children. And now bodily, little, you know, not bodily, you know, little children, physically, it's not a spiritual metaphor, uh, were coming to him and they wanted to come near him and they were pushing them away saying, you know, the Lord doesn't have time for that. We're doing bigger things. And Jesus said, let the children alone and do not hinder them from coming to me for the kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these. And after laying his hands on them, he departed from there. Now, he laid his hands on them. Um, didn't say he heal, healed them. It says he laid his hands on them. So what did he do? For them, Well, we use that passage of Scripture for child dedication. It's kind of one of the reasons we look and we see the little children are wonderful because of their, make, uh, their makeup. They're not impressed with anybody. They're not impressed with 
it's, you know, a celebrity or whatever. They're not impressed with power or money or anything. They just have this innocence about them. And uh, they came to Jesus for the right reason. And they didn't have any motives uh, there for that. And the Lord laid his hands on them and he blessed them, didn't he? So in the church, um, the Bible doesn't say that he saved them or they became saved because he touched them or he prayed for them or any of that. But there was a blessing that was bestowed. So when people come up for child dedication, you know, in some churches, it's kind of a form of initial salvation. It's your christening, right? And so that's kind of your entrance into the church type of thing. And, um, but the Bible doesn't use that uh, at all. But um, hopefully it should just be a, a thing of commitment and dedication to the Lord. Be saying, listen, Lord, I'm bringing my child to you or my young child or a little baby or whatever it is. And, and the, the main commitment is from the parents that they're willing to raise that child in the fear and admonition of the Lord. And there's a blessing, you know, that we pray not only that for, over the children that they would come to know the Lord at an early age and walk with Him, um, but that the parents would be faithful in their witness uh, to that child and life uh, to that Lord. It's a wonderful occasion, but nobody gets saved in that. And uh, they'll be saved when they profess faith in Christ and, and with their heart uh, make that decision. So, but such is the kingdom here um, and the blessing. Verse 16, and Someone came to him and they said, Teacher, what good thing shall I do that I may obtain eternal life? Okay, that's kind of a little odd. It's kind of, it's a little bit odd, isn't it, as you read that? It's like, is there something I can do to, to have eternal life? I mean, because there's something I can perform. Is there something kind of thing that I could, you know? And, and again, it's odd to us because we know you can't do anything to earn your own salvation. But even in this sentence, a little bit different, he said, teacher, what good thing shall I do that I may obtain eternal life? So Jesus, he's got a pretty good idea where this guy comes. He already knows his heart. And so he's going to kind of go along with this. And we're going to see if we can flush out what he really means by this. And um, what, we, what we do know is, is that he, he didn't come to Jesus to believe on him. All right? He didn't come to profess faith in Jesus to say, Lord, you are Lord, you are Messiah. I want to believe, you know, I trust in you and uh, any of that. Because the Lord always responds to that um, positively that way. And that's how we, of course, obtain um, eternal life. It's by faith. So Jesus plays his game, basically. Um, he's, he might be a searcher. Um, but he's not necessarily searching for God. I think he's kind of searching for the reward. And I think there's people that were like, I I'd like to go to heaven. And uh, how do I get there? And how do I obtain that? So uh, notice what he didn't. Uh, it says, verse 17, and he said to him, why are you asking me about what is good? There is only one who is good. In other words, only God is good. God's perfect. And um, so if you're hoping to be perfect um, and good, you, you can't. Um, but if you wish to enter into life, keep the commandments. Again, that's kind of a general statement. Um, but basically, if saying you want to you live a great life and have life in its best, then follow the commandments. And then he said to him, well, which ones? <laughs> Because he's just going to write them down. He's going to start going after it. And I'm going to do this. And I'm going to do that. And I'm going to do that. And he said, well, you should not commit murder. You should not commit adultery. You should not steal. You should not bear false witness. Uh, you should honor your father and mother. And you shall love your neighbor as yourself. That's a pretty good list. I think he's going to be pretty comfortable with it. I think most of the Pharisees would say the same thing. That's a lot. Those are the... Those are the horizontal commands, right? And uh, they're the ones that, of course, everybody can see and know if you do them. But Jesus left out three of them, and they were the vertical ones. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall have no idolatry. There should be nothing you know, in front of me. I should be the number one thing there. You should never take the Lord's name in vain. And Jesus kind of simplified that. When another guy came, he said, well, what's the number one command? And Jesus said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your strength, uh, and all your might. 
And then he said, and there's another, the, the second one is love your neighbor as yourself, which he included in here. So I think we're getting somewhere here. I know what he's looking for there. What about turning your heart to God? And, uh, and again, believing on, on me as the Messiah and the Savior. And the young man said to him, he said, all these things I have kept, um, what am I still lacking? Is there anything that I, I haven't done? Well, that's not really true. The Bible says all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. All of us has. And so there was no humility here in the sense that, you know, to act like you're perfect in front of the Lord, I've done all that. i got all that covered. Um, but the Lord's going to expose it. He can get to the heart. We might, he might think, hey, I'm a, I'm a great guy. I really am. Is that all? Basically, anything else? Is that all? So Jesus said to him, if you wish to be complete, then go and sell your possessions and give them to the poor. And, and you'll have treasure in heaven. Um, and then come and follow me. Well, that's true, isn't it? In fact, in comparison, in reality, if I trusted in Jesus as Messiah and King, then who cares what I own? If I'm following the King, then I'm with him in everything he owns. And so this is the same idea. If he really believed that what Jesus, who Jesus was, then he would say, listen, that's a no-brainer. What I have compared to what God has um, is incomparable. And so um, anybody would take that deal, wouldn't they? No, no. Not, not unless you loved uh, the things of this world and you loved the treasure. And so uh, then you'll have treasure in, in heaven and, and come and follow me. And I don't think the guy had to think it over that long. It just says, but when the young man heard this statement, he went away grieving. Grieving. It just made him grieve the thought of having to give up what he owned and because he was one who owned much property. And Jesus said to his disciples, Truly I, I say to you, it is hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. And the natural it is, really, because we tend to trust, you know, um, um, the power and strength of wealth, right? It, we can be, depend on it uh, a lot more than those who don't have that and have to trust in the Lord right, for their supply for each day. And again, I say to you, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. And so a lot of people try to kind of say, well, this was the eye of the, you know, the, the you know, eye of a needle um, for a camel to go through it. The eye of a needle was a little gate that they had in the wall of, of Jerusalem and, you know, was made that a man could crawl through, but of course a camel couldn't get through it and all that. I don't, we don't know. I don't, we don't have any proof of that. I think he was just saying what he meant. Um, you, know, you can get a camel to go through an eye of a needle, but you've got to chop them into pretty small little pieces, right? So it stands for itself. And when the disciples heard this, they were very astonished. And they said, well, then who can be saved? And um, that's true in the natural. Jesus says, well, wait a minute. And looking at them, Jesus said, with people, this is impossible, but with God, all things are possible. It's impossible for a guy who's trusting in his wealth. The Bible says the love of money is the root of all evil. It's not money. Several of Jesus' closest men, including Lazarus, were very wealthy, extremely wealthy. Um, but they love the Lord. And uh, Nicodemus, right? And he, he ended up being a follower of the Lord and uh, he was very wealthy, but he uh, loved the Lord. So, but basically what he's saying is the, 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 the key to that is a personal relationship with Christ and a love for him. And as we walk with him, you know what he does so easily? He reminds us that this stuff is stuff. It's not what makes me happy. It's not what's going to change my life or give me a better life and all that. Even though we think it could or it would and if I only had this much money I would be happy and I would no it's a, never been the recipe for you know uh, eternal bliss in life in fact it brings all kinds of trials it's a root of all evil it's the love of it and uh, the dependence upon it and so of course it's impossible to be saved if you're depending on 
your money instead of on, uh, on the Lord. And so he says, with people, this is impossible, but with God, all things are possible. Then Peter said to him, behold, well, we've left everything and followed you. What then will there be for us? Now, this is kind of get the heart of what's been going on for a while. Uh, Jesus took three of them and he took them up on the mountain, Mount Tr- Transfiguration, and they got to see him in his glory. It was amazing, but he didn't take the rest of them. And uh, God knew he had his own appointment with that, Peter, James, and John. But when they came back, there was a little stirring, a little stewing. Why did he only take you? Why not us? And then, of course, they couldn't reveal all that they saw because the Lord said, I want you to keep this until after the resurrection. Then you could tell the 12, you know, afterwards. But all of that was playing into the hands of the Lord because he was going to be dealing with them on their attitudes one toward another. And so Peter He's still thinking in that same way. Well, we've given everything we have. You know, what is the reward? Uh, How how great is that reward? Um, And so, what will it be for us? And Jesus said to them, truly I say to you that uh, you who have followed me in the regeneration, when the Son of Man will sit on his glorious throne, you also shall sit upon 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. That's a special thing we think of for the apostles, it was a unique position. Of course, Judas wasn't going to be one of them. He was discarded for betraying the Lord and, put, and uh, you know, committing suicide, of course. His place was taken away and Matthias, right? Wasn't it Matthias? Yeah. Was given that position uh, on the day of Pentecost or right before the day of Pentecost. Um, Peter said, we need to choose a, a 12th. Part of that could be for this reason. Uh, If we're going to sit on the 12 thrones, there needs to be 12 of us. But he also quoted the Old Testament speaking about the 12 that that the Lord would use. And so uh, that was very purposeful. And then then the book of Revelation, we see 24 elders there. uh, But I'm not sure that this part talks about that. I think this part talks about those apostles who were all Jews... Um, all all Jewish uh, people, um, men. Um, I think when the Lord returns and comes back in his glory is what he's speaking about. And they'll have been regenerated, right? There'll be the rapture of the church and, and they're, they're will coming back. So there might be a role for them in the millennial kingdom of the Lord as well, which is an eternal kingdom. And uh, sitting there on the uh, throne there, but we do see 24 thrones around the heavenly throne as well. But this is for specifically for judging the 12 tribes of Israel. So when Jesus comes back, he's going to be in Jerusalem. He'll be ruling and reigning from Jerusalem over the entire earth. And he'll rebuild all of that. And and the land will be allotted to the 12 tribes. And so these these 12 guys will will, uh, maybe have that. That's pretty amazing. That's a pretty great reward, isn't it? And um, um, so he says, and, verse 29, everyone who has left houses and our brothers or sisters or father or mother, our children or farms for my name's sake. Only God knows that. How many people have done that? At great expense of the things of this earth um, because of the persecution, they were willing to leave that. I love the picture of Moses in Hebrews 11 when he talks about that, of the faith of Moses. He was willing to walk away from Pharaoh's house as the second highest uh, person, you know, in all of the most powerful, you know, kingdom on earth. And, and you know, he speaks and he says, he says, he was pleased to be able to do it and to go be with the people of God. He considered it, and uh, it's a no-brainer. I'm going to go with God. And so he says, we'll receive many times as much and will inherit eternal life. But many who are first will be last and the last first. So he kind of ends the chapter there with this idea that but it isn't going to go down exactly like you think it is. Uh, you know, the, my kingdom's different. Uh, the first are last and the last are first. And so they weren't really understanding this, so he kind of gives them uh, an update. So stay with me for a few more minutes. We'll read through this story. It says, for the kingdom of heaven, speaking of first and last, um, he gets the idea that these guys still really haven't got it. Um, they're still thinking about what they can get and what they're going to get out of this kingdom. And he's going to 
teach him a lesson. For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. And when he had agreed with the laborers for a denarius for the day, they made a, made a deal, made a covenant there that yeah, we'll work today, but we, we're going to get a denarius. And so he sent them into his vineyard. And, and then he went about the third hour and he saw others standing idle in the marketplace. He didn't have any work. And to those he said, you also go into the vineyard and whatever is right, I will give you. So those guys, they went into the vineyard. They didn't know what they were getting. They just went into the vineyard because it was work, right? And they just trusted that the landowner would, would take care of them. And so um, whatever's right, I'll give you. And so they went. And again, he went out about the sixth hour and the ninth hour and did the same thing. Those guys just went to work. And about the 11th hour, he went out and he found others standing around. And he said to them, why have you been standing here idle all day, uh, all day long? And they said to him, because no one has hired us. And he said to them, you go into the vineyard too. And when evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, so it probably started about 6 o'clock with this covenant with these other guys. And by 3 o'clock in the afternoon or 4 o'clock, almost the end of the day, getting close to sunset, 6 o'clock probably. Um, when evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, and here's what he said to him. He said, call the laborers and pay them their wages, beginning with the last <laughs> group to the first. So we're going to watch how this unfolds. And then those hired about the 11th hour that were the last ones to come did the least amount of work. Each one receives a denarius. And so these guys who made this deal at 6, you know, 6 a.m. or the beginning of the day, they worked all day long and they see these guys get a denarius. So what's going through their mind? Wow. What do you think we're going to get? If they got a denarius for just working the last part, what are we going to get when we get there? Then those hired about the 11th hour came, and says, oh, excuse me, and when... Those hired first came, they thought that they would receive more, but each of them received a denarius. And they were, when they received it, they grumbled at the landowner, saying, these last men worked only one hour and you've made them equal to us. Now that's the phrase, equal to us. We should be greater. We should have more who have borne the burden and the scorching heat of the day. But he answered and he said to one of them, he said, friend, I, I'm doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for a denarius? Take what is yours and go, was a fair day's wage. But I wish uh, to give this last man the same as you. Uh, it is not lawful, is it not lawful for me to do what I wish with what is my own? Or is your eye envious because I am generous? So the last shall be first and the first last. The Lord has um, the ability to award us as he wishes. Now what's interesting is the first group was the only unique group in this. They agreed to, a they, they worked for a contract. But all the rest who came in just worked, trusting that the landowner would give them whatever's fair. There was a, there was a little bit of an attitude here with these uh, apostles that, you know, they were owed something for what they had. And so they wanted this contract. Well, what are we going to get? What are you going to give us? All right? And so he was telling them, listen, better to just work for the landowner, for the Lord, and let him reward you because he's going to be uh, generous and gracious. It isn't about a works thing. And I'm going to try to work more than you. And I'm going to try to earn more than you. And I'm going to be more wealthier than you. Because that's what was going in their mind. I want to be better than all the other 11 guys. I want to be the greatest in the kingdom. And so <laughs> the Lord's kingdom doesn't work that way. In fact, if you work with that motive, you don't get rewarded. And he tells the story in another section here. He says, listen, in the judgment seat of Christ, we're all going to stand before the Lord. And when we stand before the Lord, he's not going to bring our sin and pile it up in the, in the ground before us. Thank the Lord. It's under the blood of Christ. But he's going to take our works. 
whatever we've done for the Lord. That's when it gets interesting because you don't know why everybody does whatever they do in the church or for, you know, to be seen or whatever their motives are or to be better than the other person or to look better than the other person. Who knows what all it is? But God knows, doesn't he? So you lay it all out there in front of him and the Bible says, you know, either those of precious stones or wood, hay, and stubble. Stubble. But then the fire of the Lord, the testing of the Lord for those works is going to be applied to it. And all the wood, hay, and stubble is going to burn up. Poof. And people are going to be shocked at what's left. And some people are going to have, you know, a smaller pile that's there and the Lord's going to put his thing to it and all of it's going to remain. And so um, better to let the Lord, the Lord's gracious, the Lord's generous, um, you know, for me, I'm not working for a reward. I'm, I, I want to work for the Lord, right? And that we have to be reminded of that. And um, um, I'm thankful to be going to heaven. I want to go to heaven. Um, but, you know, it's like David said, he said, I, as far as it comes to the Lord's house, I, I'll be a doorkeeper. That'd be wonderful to me. He's the king. He's like, man, I'd love just to be a doorkeeper. I'd just be a guy that can open the door. And it's kind of funny because in the kingdom, he's going to be a doorkeeper. <laughs> but the front door. And all who come in, uh, Ezekiel says, uh, uh, Paul will be the one there that they will be, uh, will be greeting them as they come to meet uh, with the Lord. Anyway, amazing. Love it. That's God's way. That's his, um, of doing things. Uh, verse 17, as Jesus was about to go up to Jerusalem, he took the 12 um, disciples aside by themselves and on the way, he said to them, Behold, we are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered to the chief priests and the scribes, and they will condemn him to death. Oh, by the way, I'm going to die. I'm going to my death. And will hand him over to the Gentiles to mock and scourge and crucify him. And on the third day, he will be raised up. He just laid it all out for them in more detail than he ever has. Third time that he's spoken to him about this, and now he's given him the details. Basically, they're going to hang me on a cross. The Gentiles, the Romans, are going to hang me, and uh, they're going to scourge me, and they're going to crucify me. And uh, on the third day, I'll be raised up. Poof! Right over their head. <laughs> they don't get it, right? Even up till the end, they're like, where are you going? We don't know where you're going. We don't know how. We don't know how to... To follow you if you go. Then the mother, uh, think about this. He just hears that. This is what Jesus is doing. And then the mother of the sons of Zebedee came to Jesus with her sons bowing down and making a request of him. And he said to her, uh, what do you wish? And she said to him, command that in your kingdom, these two sons of mine may sit with me, with you uh, on your right and one on your right and one on your left. I just, that's all I want. I want, you know, uh, which is James and John and the ones that had gone up there. And, you know, that's a mom, I guess. And uh, breaks all of this by, you know, in front of everyone, brings her two sons, the other ten are watching. And she's like, all I want is these two to be the greatest. I want them one on your right, one on your left. Jesus answers, he says, I, uh, you don't know what you're asking, um, Are you able to drink the cup that I am about to drink? He just told you. that. Is that what you want to be first for? You want to be first to to die to the cross, you know, to to pay? And they said to him, we are able. That's amazing to me because those are, John was going to be one of the great men of, of the apostles. He's going to live a long life, but he was going to be tortured and boiled in oil and then abandoned on a rock area by Rome and and live out his last days till he dies. And James was going to be one of the first ones uh, martyred as the apostles. His head was going to be cut off. He says, "Yeah, yeah, yeah. We we were with you. <laughs> we know we know that they were going to learn those lessons, but they hadn't learned it yet." And uh, verse twenty three, he said to them, "He says, My cup you shall drink, but to sit on my right hand and my left." Um, This is not mine to give. They just saw Moses and Elijah on each side with the Lord. And now they think they should be there. 
But it is for those for whom it has been prepared by my father. And hearing this, the ten became indignant with the two brothers. After all that he had told them about, of loving one another, forgiving one another, don't drive out a sheep there, don't wound another sheep, and all of this, they just blew the whole thing, didn't they? And, uh, and wiped it all out. They caused their brothers to stumble at a fence because they wanted to be greater than the rest of them. It's a mess, and there's not much time left. But Jesus said to them, he called them, and he said to them, and he said, you know that the rulers of the uh, Gentiles lord it over them, and their great men exercise authority over them. Is it not this way among you? But whoever wishes to become great among you shall be your servant. And whoever wishes to be first among you shall be your slave, just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. You're not going to think that way when you see me go to the cross and die and then rise again and you're going to realize that I did it for you. That all of that was to serve you and to serve this world. Your picture of leadership is going to change. It's going to come and be conformed into my image. It's a beautiful passage. Don't have time to read it tonight, but it's in Philippians chapter 2. And the gist of it is Paul, he got it. He understood it. He said, if we're ever going to come into unity and if we're ever going to um, see the kingdom of God go forward, then we're going to have to have the nature of Christ who didn't think being God was so lofty that he wasn't willing to come and die for lowly man and to serve us. And he just lays the whole thing out. And he says, we need to have that same attitude it needs to be in us. Finish up here, verse 29. And they were leaving Jericho. A large crowd followed him. And two blind men sitting by the road, hearing, what Jesus, uh, hearing that Jesus was passing by, they cried out and they said, Lord, have mercy on us. Son of David, it's a great thing to call him. It means you're the Messiah, you're the Savior sent by God, our King and our Lord. The crowd sternly told them to be quiet, but they cried out all the more. Now, first they were pushing away the little children. Now they're, now they're telling the blind men, to, you know, the cr- crowds. And the Lord, um, they cried out all the more, Lord, Son of David, have mercy on us. And Jesus stopped and he called them and he said, what do you want me to do for you? And they said to him, Lord, we want our eyes to be opened. Moved with compassion, Jesus touched their eyes and immediately they regained their sight and they followed him. Um, Interesting because the other accounts, Mark and Luke, also speak of this and we know that blind Bartimaeus is part of that. And a great story there, um, undoubtedly. Um, he's the more notable of the two uh, blind men. But what's the idea of it? These men had blind faith, didn't they? Here are these men who can see Jesus and are walking with Jesus and they can touch Jesus just like um, you know, the apostles will do when Jesus is resurrected from the dead. It'll be Thomas who'll say, unless I can see with my own eyes and touch you with my own hands, I, I'm not going to believe By grace, Jesus appeared amongst them and he said, hey, Thomas, come here. (laughs) And he went over to the Lord and he said, touch, put your hand, put your hand there. Put your your hand over here on my side. Not a spirit, it's me. And he he said, my Lord and my God. It's a great revelation. But Jesus turned and he kind of rebuked him in a way. He said, well, blessed are those who haven't seen and yet believe. And uh, what a picture that is, because that's us, right? We've never seen the Lord bodily, um, but we've heard the truth, the truth of God's word, and we know that he's Lord and King, and we put our faith and trust to him, just like those blind men did. They didn't have to see him, but they knew (laughs) by his, you know, the words that they'd heard of him, and uh, they knew that he was the Son of God. Let's pray together. Lord, fascinating how great it would be Uh, to walk with you on this earth, but even better yet, we're going to get to walk with you on this earth (laughs) uh, one day ahead of time here. You're preparing us to, to be servants of yours in your kingdom, and what a great privilege that is, but the lesson here was 
the preparation that it takes, Lord, to be a follower of yours. And we got to get it through our minds that it isn't for us to be over anybody. It's for us to, to serve others. And it's really difficult for us in our flesh, Lord, but it helps us to know that you're the greatest servant of all. You're the greatest in the kingdom. Nobody greater in the kingdom than you because nobody was willing to serve more or greater than you. And Lord, we love that about you. Thank you, God, for sending your son to be that example for us. That's what's great. And help us, Lord, to desire to be great in your kingdom. Strip that pride right out of us. Shame on John, James and John. What was going through their mind and and even mama uh, in that. She missed everything. And I know those guys wept over that later on. Uh, God, please just make us your servants and your slaves. And so adjust our hearts accordingly. And we pray that in Jesus' name. Amen.